Micromobility has arrived in the Los Angeles area. There are dockless bikes, smart bikes, electric bikes, and scooters to transport people all around. We know that the biggest drawback to the Metropolitan Transit Authority modes of travel is that one mile radius to the transportation hubs and from the hubs to the work. These options fill in the gaps. Jump, Razor, Lime, Motivate, and Bird are a few of the 11 companies giving us these travel choices. We see them all over the place and in far-flung locations, day by day. I wonder how many people use these forms of passage to see and root on the runners of the Los Angeles Marathon that's happening right now. At this time, Beverly Hills wants nothing to do with them, and you will be cited if you even go through their streets, so stay away. There could soon be 100,000 scooters in this area. If the businesses decide to follow the regulations that are being set city by city and week by week and agree to place them as well as in high-income areas in low-income neighborhoods. When passing a nondescript location and seeing a bird scooter on its side, we can begin to wonder. Who downloaded that app to locate, unlock, and pay for the ride to that gas station? Are they in the convenience store buying a blue raspberry Slurpee? Do they live in an apartment behind the gas station and just made it home for work? Did they enjoy the ride? Where did they start their trip? Are they happy in their family unit or are they wishing to have more friends? When will someone come around, pick it up, and where will that scooter go? Will the micro-mobility user check his app tomorrow to find one close by and start all over again? Please consider and pray for this person who is living in our neighborhood and therefore is our neighbor and needing our care. When Ron sends out the sermon primer on Friday of sometimes, the scripture passages are listed. If one chooses to look them over, as our liturgists for sure do, one can begin to ask the same questions. Where did this passage come from? What is it, was its meaning when it was created? How will it be used today? And will it be picked up again in our daily meanderings in life tomorrow? How does it help us get to the meaning of our faith and give us tips about behavior towards each other and our environment? Psalm 63 is the call of one who is looking for God, longing for the steadfast love or kindness. From the moment we rise to the time of our sleep at night in our beds, the psalmist states that we are searching, seeking, clinging for life to the Holy One. This writer is afraid, seeking God in the sanctuary. Where might that sanctuary be? Might it be out in the sunshine? We have missed our regular allotment of time in the sun, so when we see the sunlight, we can now feel the warmth and glow. We know that the sun is using up her energy and gas is burning, sending us the needed rays, but God's energy will never be used up. Is the sanctuary in the courtyard of a temple? Is it in their workplace? Is it on a road? And where is your sanctuary? The image of protection as God sprouts wings for us is endearing. In Los Angeles, it is permissible to raise chickens if you are 35 feet away from your neighbor. To have a rooster, however, you need 100 feet. So you have to have enough land to harvest those eggs. The Los Animals Shelter will let you adopt some of their chickens or a rooster after you take their backyard chicken feeding workshop. It was just held last weekend. God as a hen spreading her wings when a possum, raccoon, or coyote gets too close. To feel sheltered, no matter what the issue is, is so helpful to our everyday existence because things happen, and right out of the blue. 
Listen to what Jesus states about these type of occurrences as we hear from Luke 13, verses 1 through 5. At that very time, there were some present who told him, Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, Do you think because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Jesus is a Galilean who receives a political report. People have come to his side to speak about their community members who were put to death by Pilate. We read in history that Pilate and his killings at one point leads him to be called to Rome to account for his actions. We might think that Jesus would condemn his actions and state how wrong he was to take lives. But no, he turns it into a lesson about repentance. Right away, he adds his own illustration of the collapse of a wall around Jerusalem, killing 18 people. Just as we have trees falling, the Jewish community receives hate mail, Muslims killed in their mosques, so too does Jesus know of the sadness of these incidents, and they are not to blame. Bad things happen to all kinds of people, not just those who perform the worst type of actions. In a similar mode, we can also know that our good fortune is not evidence of special blessing. Our need for repentance, a changed mind leading towards a new way of viewing the world, is critical and is in our grasp. We can do it during Lent and in the life cycle of our church. Next, the writer of Luke decides to place yet another agricultural parable following these sad incidents. Then he told the parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to his gardener, see here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. If not, you can cut it down. The word of our Lord. The parable of the barren fig tree, a parable of mercy. This tree has no fruit, and the owner is impatient. Take it out. But the gardener asks for more time, another cycle, another year. He will not let that year go to waste, but will work the soil, add amendments, and take extraordinary care to ensure it will bear fruit, and thus survive to see more sun and rain. I have spoken to a fig owner, uh, one Christine Smith, who stated that this uh, parable, while it does not answer the question of survival, she believes that the care offered by the gardener, one can assume that, yes, there will be fruit. It does not say that, but we listen to you, Christine Smith. On the cover of your bulletin, there is an image on the left side of... Uh, of a small fig tree. The title of the photo is, See, My Fig Tree is Back. In the larger view of the photo, there's evidence of a large circle around the root ball offering a place for needed water and manure. This gardener, like the one in Luke, must have had a specific plan in mind, which worked. 1 Corinthians states to be careful. Watch out that you do not fall. Mobility is precious, and all are in the same situation of falling to temptation or to living in an evil state. But we are assured 
that God is faithful and will shelter us so that whatever we have to endure will somehow or other be manageable. Just like the fig tree found out, life carves out opportunities for us to serve God's graciousness so that the fruit will be harvested. As we know that horrible actions come unannounced, it can remind us of the preciousness of life. The day-to-day moments of seeing the painted lady butterflies stream across the fields, of eating a cake given wholeheartedly by Xavier, who appreciates eating together with this congregation following worship, of a cough long lodged in our body that finally leaves so that our voice returns to praise God through song. We learn how to move along in this world in different ways year by year, perhaps using razor scooters and dockless bikes. We see others doing it and think about how it could help us in our efforts to reduce carbon and ease us into the MTA system. Our sacred text leads us towards clearer understandings about how to live as the people of God. If each of the scriptures we use today eased us a mile or so closer to where we need to be, then they have done their work. They are at our ready. The Holy Bible, sitting in your apartments, homes, or tents, ready to get you a little further with each new realization about meaning and help for our lives. Our Lenten devotionals with photos and mindfulness increasingly can help us. As we rise each new day, may our first thoughts be not towards grinding the Love Buzz Equal Exchange coffee, but of our relationship with God and to each other and to the world. Let us move along in our faith in new ways, carefully, thoughtfully, in different locations, counting on the Spirit to push us forward, creating heaven on earth. Amen.